Well, thank you once again, everyone. Welcome to Sunday's Bible study. And after a few glitches there, we're back on online. And I hope that we'll get through this without a glitch, but let's see how we go. But in terms of where we are in our study, we are at, literally at the last chapter of the last chapter of First Thessalonians chapter 5. And that'll close off our study for First Thessalonians. And what this chapter entails is quite significant in terms of its connection to the rapture and its connection to the end of what dispensationally we've been studying, the church age. And all these things come at a really interesting juncture because Christianity right now is poised on two positions. Well, I should say there's multiple positions now, but two main ones. And the first position that we all hold, and anyone who holds dispensationally to the Scriptures, the King James Bible, will hold to a pre-millennial, pre-tribulation position. That is, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Body of Christ, will be taken out of the world, taken to heaven prior to the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, or what is called Daniel's 70th week. That's the position that we here hold to. The other position, which is the most popular right now and has become popularized over the last two decades by men who really have not rightly divided the word of truth and who have gone to the Greek and the Hebrew to justify their position. These men and these people or these Christians, I should say, they hold to the position of a post-tribulation return of Jesus Christ, and that is he returns all in one hit. So all the things you read in terms of the Bible, New Testament, that has to do with the return of Jesus Christ, they mash it all in one and jam it all in one big event, and it's called the Second Advent. And many other denominations, cults, and pseudo-sect, pseudo-Christian groups they also hold to that kind of viewpoint, the post-tribulation return of Jesus Christ. So the understanding that we have had for our last studies is always been that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to catch the body of Christ out before the tribulation, which is we've proved and established that via Scripture. And First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 10, we're going back, back a few months now when we started. It says this, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath, God's wrath, is being poured out over a seven-year period. And that seven-year period known as Daniel's 70th week. <clears throat> I think we've gone through other prophecies, especially Daniel chapter 9. But that wrath is being poured out across those seven years, and the church is not here. The church is in heaven. So the Lord Jesus has delivered us from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. We don't have an appointment with those that time coming, the tribulation. There is no appointment for the church. So for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And how to escape the wrath that is to come. How do we escape the tribulation, the great tribulation, through the salvation that is in Jesus Christ right now? And that's Paul's gospel. And that's being saved by his death, burial, and resurrection, trusting in his righteousness in the blood of Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. And that's all it is. It, all it is is that you're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's how simple it is to get saved today. But I want to touch base with everyone on the fact remains that God needs to settle accounts and he will settle the accounts. But in terms of the church and the unrighteous, the church and the wicked, the question came to Abraham when he had a visitation from, from God. And he asked the question because the Lord was about to take his leave and head on down to see what was going down in Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis chapter 18. And Abraham had a question for the Lord, and he asked the question, will the righteous 
suffer and will the righteous be punished with the wicked? And Genesis 18, 25 says this, that be it far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. And that's a question that all those who hold to a post-tribulation rapture or post-tribulation return of Jesus Christ, they need to understand that here in Genesis 18, 25, the question is asked by Abraham, will God allow the righteous to suffer and feel also the threat and be slain with the wicked? And the answer comes in the next verse, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And, and then God starts to give out mercy. You now, if God found 50 men or 50 people who would repent, he would stay the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, even if he found 20 and then it went down. And I think it went right down. But no, there was none that were righteous. The only ones that were left was Lot and his family or Lot and his two daughters. That was it, three of them. So we have this question. That question is always beckons an answer when we look at the wickedness that is going on right now, the absolute deterioration, depravity of this world right now. Will God allow the church to suffer the same fate as the wicked? Nay, absolutely not. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And what God does right is the truth from the scriptures is that God catches out the church. He removes the church from the wicked, from this world of wickedness, and he takes it to heaven. And anyone who is saved in Jesus Christ today will be taken out before the tribulation. So we've been here before. I return back to the same image here, the return of Jesus Christ in three stages. We'll collaborate over this. We'll sort of, answered the questions of the three returns of Jesus Christ. And we noticed that the return of Jesus Christ, the first return of Jesus Christ is for the church age saints, the kingdom of God. And the scriptures are there for your uh, perusal and understanding for your source material there. So the first return of Jesus Christ is for the church and he comes himself. The next return of Jesus Christ is during the tribulation at the post-tribulation, almost mid to post, no one knows the day or the hour of this one. The scriptures basically state that this is the return of Jesus Christ. Number two, for the tribulation saints, that's the elect of Israel. The elect of, I should say, the children of the bride chamber, the guests to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so this is the return of Jesus Christ that most, if not all, Christianity has been positioned in because they don't study, they've gotten their whole doctrine mixed up, the rapture mixed up in this return of Jesus Christ for Israel. And we're going to go through some of that to this afternoon. So this one here, the last return of Jesus Christ, the first two is for the saints, church age saints, number one. Number two is for the tribulation saints, the second advent known as the return of Jesus Christ with the saints. It's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, two crowns coming back to the earth. And it's the Lord coming back. And it's also known as the day of the Lord. That's what it's called. The day of the Lord is when the Lord comes back for vengeance, vengeance upon the enemies of God and also to rescue the remnant of Israel. So I've got here just a, a little image here and i'll bring up the text very soon from first thessalonians chapter five our last chapter as we just go for the, through for the first seven verses as we exposit that but just to th have a look at the picture here you, the church in 2023 is always ahead of the destruction it's always ahead of the day of the lord the day of the lord the tribulation and all the judgments that come with it Daniel's 70th week, it is the most horrific and terrorizing time that's ever been experienced on the earth. It is rumbling behind the church. It is on its way. It's just about touch base with us because as soon as we go, it starts. So it's always behind us. And the question here in the scripture is asked by 
the disciples and he was and asked by Paul the apostle, but the disciples asked the same question. And first Thessalonians chapter five, verses one. Here we go. But of the times and season, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, comma, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Let's just unpack that for just a bit. The times and the seasons. I'm just going to reshare. I'll just share the scriptures. So let me go to the scriptures. I want to go to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. So Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. And we're going to talk about this times and the seasons because it's very important. Because the question that Paul beckons here is, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Paul knew, and he said to the church of the Thessalonians, and in, in it's saying, to, Paul is saying this to us, you have no need that I write unto you concerning the times and the seasons, because the times and the seasons has to do with the kingdom of heaven, that is the nation, the physical, literal, visible nation of Israel. So when you see that, Paul's saying, I don't have to write to you these things because they're not related to you. So be aware that when you see the times and the seasons, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 7 says this. And when and this is just before the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven, after the 40 days, he was with the disciples 40 days, 40 nights. And again, a lot of things were spoken by the Lord Jesus to comfort the disciples and equip them. Well, verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 6 says this, When they therefore were come together, that's the disciples, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And so here's the question from the disciples to the Lord Jesus about the restoration of the kingdom. This is what all the Jewish people are looking forward to, a kingdom that's at the head of the nations, it's the Jewish people, and a kingdom that's been promised in the Old Testament. And so the question is asked the Lord, will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord says to the disciples, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. It is not up for us to know the times and the seasons and to worry about it because those things are in God the Father's hands. They're in his power. And so anything time you see times in the season, it always is in relation to the literal, visible, physical nation of Israel. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief. Let me reshare back the screen. And hopefully you can see that screen back again. The question here i want to pose to you this afternoon is for well, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night a thief in the night that's a really big question when it comes to what is the thief for the most part the thief has always been in the parables of the lord jesus it's always been the a nobleman or someone went away and they came back and it was the picture of Im imminency, the picture of surprise, that the, the coming of the thief in the night was always in relation to the return of Jesus Christ. And so it is. But in this context, in the context of this verse, Paul is speaking directly about something else. For yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back with the armies of heaven and he takes and wipes out the entire enemies of God. So cometh as a thief in the night. So the thief in the night in this context is the day of the Lord. If you can just wrap your minds in that. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. Peace and safety. Be it known today that that will be the very words that the world is going to echo and declare around the world. 
You know, to be on CNN, be on NBC, MSNBC, be on ABC and all the channels, be on all the blogs and all the, the social medias, if there's still any. But peace and safety will be those two words, not peace and security. King James Bible is very clear that peace and safety will be the words that will be declared by the world. And yet the Bible says, then sudden destruction comes. Now we're talking about the interesting part here. And I'm just deviating here from, I shouldn't say deviating, but I'm trying to connect this because we're talking about the day of the Lord, talking about the removal of the righteous from the wicked and the on, or should say the incoming judgments of God on the world. And there's a picture or a typology that's running in Luke 17, 26, 29. Most expositors today would use this as a picture of these of the days of Noah, yet that relates to nation of Israel going through the tribulation. The days of Lot might refer to the church. But there are applications where we can rightly divide these texts. But I think when I'm looking at this, in as I see this, when you rightly divide, there are truths or hidden things that come with the King James Bible. And I believe that it's, it's always called the hidden, the hidden Bible. If you believe what you read and you see things, it's because the Lord has, and you come with a heart that is contrite and humble. The Lord will open your mind, and I'm telling you, he will open your mind fully to see the revelation that he has for you in his word. Now, I got looking at this, this scripture, and it's a scripture that we all know, and I'm going to read it because it has to do this picture of it. There's a picture and typology of the removal of the church. Even though there's doctrinally, there may not be, but in terms of the application in the doctrine of the return of Jesus Christ, I want to share this with you. So Luke 17, 26 to 29, three verses. As it was in the days of Noe, that's Noe, that's because the Greek, remember the Hebrew was translated into Greek, and so that's how they uh, wrote it. The King James translators, Noe, <clears throat> it was, was it Noah, as we know. So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, and here we go, until, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. There's a point where it was a cutoff point, terminating point, until the day Noah entered into the ark. Likewise, here we go, verse 8. Also, as it was in the days of Lot, remember Lot, Genesis 13. Okay, we've got Sodom and Gomorrah, and then Genesis 18. Likewise, also, in the, it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained, what, fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So there's a terminating point there too. Two events, two terminating points, yet they seem to house one story. And that one story I'm just going to share with you because there's a picture here of the removal of the church. And what is it all about? Well, one, you could, you could almost unequivocally just describe the very world we're living in right now. Drinking, marrying, wives, given in marriage. Now, we're talking about the under biblical understanding of marriage. I'm not talking about going down the aisle in a white dress and boat tuxedo, whatever it is, how marriage is a, a condition and govern these days. It's not talking about that. The biblical essence of a marriage was two people, male and female, coming together, and they were united sexually, bodily. That was it, marriage. We're talking about a time now that they're just married wives that were given in marriage, and that describes the very thing that's going on right now. And nowadays, you don't know who's getting married to who. So when we have this whole Romans chapter one really hitting home right now, men with men burning in their lusts, 
or the depravity, read chapter read chapter one of Romans, and you'll get a absolute clear understanding from the scriptures, the depravity of what this world has become, and especially this country. Likewise, Lot, same thing. What's happening today? They ate, drank, bought, sold, planted, built it. The whole life cycle of society is running right now. It is running even though after the, the, the events that have shaped the last three years and now have proven that the world is just on its downward collapse. The age of the Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles is about to come in. Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 11. Very clear that the fullness of the Gentiles is about to take place. What is interesting about these two events, Noah and Lot, Noah entered the ark, and it's interesting. Just say, come with me on this understanding. I'm just going to share with you. Noah entered the ark, and what's the ark? It's a ship. What's the ship on? So water goes on water, and was about to go through water. So he enters into a ship, that's the ark, which is about to go through water. Lot went out of Sodom and escaped. So Lot went out. Noah went in. So get that understanding. One speaks about entering, the other about leaving. These two events are types of the rapture of the church. If you put it together, one could read Luke 17, 26, 29 as this. Now, I'm only just giving you just a, a gist of what I think, what it looks like. And this is the rapture. You enter the ship, clouds, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, immediately after you have left the world, or we enter in the clouds after we are caught up from the earth. They are one, two events, yet displaying one precious truth, and it's the precious truth of the God taking out the righteous from the wicked, if you can get that. Remember Genesis chapter 18? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And to do right, the Lord is going to remove the church away from the wickedness of this earth and from the wicked. And then as soon as, as Lot did, as he left, and as soon as Noah entered, what happened? The flood came, and for Lot, fire and brimstone came. So we're seeing immediate declaration of heaven on judgment on this earth. As soon as the righteous were taken out, as soon as the church is taken out, the declaration of judgment is upon this earth immediately. And we're going to see that as we go along because in this slide here, you can see I've just placed just a little timeline. The rapture of the church takes place and it goes to heaven. We all go to heaven. We're not here anymore. This world is not our home. We're just a passing through. And things start to take place. I'm not going to go through all the details, but we've got peace and safety being declared. And all these things start moving. So if you just want to analyze this slide here, you've got things that are happening. As soon as the church disappears and it leaves the earth, leaves the earth and leaves the world to its filth and rot and wickedness and its depravity, the church goes to the judgment seat of Christ and then becomes an audience, an audience according to Revelation chapter 6, to the opening of the seals, Revelation chapter 5, where the Lord Jesus Christ opens up the scrolls and opens the seals, and then judgment starts to be declared on this earth. And so we're seeing that. And here's First Thessalonians chapter 5, and this is verse 4. But ye brethren are not in darkness. We're not in darkness, everyone. That that day, what's the day? The day of the Lord should overtake you as a thief. The day of the Lord is rumbling behind us, everyone. It is rumbling and it is catching up very quickly because our exit is about to take place. Once we exit the world, the day of the Lord, the wrath of God being poured out on this earth for seven years will, it, will eventuate and lead and terminate at the day of the Lord when God comes back. And we come back with him on horses to destroy the enemies of God and rescue the remnant of Israel and issue in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. These are the things that are really happening. So if you are 
getting discouraged in your life, if you are finding that, look, the world is just making me discouraged, well, perk up. The rapture is about to take place. There's nothing in that of all your problems and all your tribulations and persecutions, whatever it is, that cannot be solved when the Lord, when the trumpet sounds and we go home. So how precious is the truth and how comforting is the understanding of the rapture of the church before the tribulation. But this is what's going to happen. And these are the things that are happening to Israel while they're here, because the as we as I mentioned to you guys on Friday night, the judgments or the seven year tribulation, Daniel's seventieth week, is primarily focused on the nation of Israel. And what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be a slaughter, the slaughter of Jews on a scale that we have never seen before, on a scale of the history of the world. And we know that World War II and the Holocaust of the Jewish people with both Hitler and Stalin is going to be a Sunday school picnic compared to what's coming for the Jewish people. Judgment is coming and the refinement process of God is going to be placed on this people. Got to remember the Jewish people are in blindness, Romans chapter 11. It's the mystery that God has that they are all blind in part till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The Jewish people are also under subservience to Rome because they did not want God to rule over them. So God gave them up to their reprobate position that they are in right now, Christ rejecting nation, and they serve Rome. And who's Rome today? We all know that. We all studied that. Rome today is represented in the Vatican, the papacy. The Jewish people, they all are in line because God has it that way. And we've gone through that study and we'll, probably touch base on that study sometime again to refresh our minds. But here's the scriptures. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. Saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And here we go. We're going to see the slaughter of Jews and also the rejection, the slaughter, and essential God's going to remove two-thirds he's literally just going through the whole visible nation of israel and cleaning and filtering them out paul says in romans 9 6 that not all of israel is israel you see there's a filtering process that god is going to do through the tribulation because he needs a people that is going to be refined and going to represent him throughout all the ages it is probably so sorry in verse 8 it says it shall come to pass and in all the land saith the lord two parts therein shall be cut off and die that's two parts of the jewish people but the third shall be left therein this third part is the one that god is going to refine as fire he's going to try them as gold is tried and they shall call upon my name i will hear them i will say it is my people they shall say the lord is my god my guess that this third here is the third of the remnant that is to flee Jerusalem and make their way down to the wilderness in the Jordan, around the area of Petra, the land of Edom, the land of Esau. And it's that third that God is going to protect. The rest, God's going to reject. And yet in that rejection of the rest, you're going to find there's something going on also. And I'll just mention in the next slide, but it is probable that the third part of Israel that is refined by the Lord during the tribulation will replace the third of the stars that Satan with his tail cast down to the earth. Remember, stars are distinct from the sons of God or angels. And I've been through with that in the book of Revelation, which we studied in chapter 12, that stars and angels are distinct. And you'll find this in Daniel chapter 12, 1 and 3. At that time shall Michael the uh, stand up, the great prince. Michael is the archangel that stands up for Israel, but standeth for the children of thy people. That's Israel. Verse 3, and they that be wise, talking about Jews, talking about the Israel, those who are righteous, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forevermore, forever and ever. That's forever and ever. So it's probable that the third of the stars will be replaced by that third of the nation of visible nation of Israel that God is refining. What is also interesting in those two thirds that have been slaughtered or by God and rejected, 
in that two-third is also one-tenth, and I'm going to show you this. It's all in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 11 to 13, the slaughter of the Jews. And you saw a picture of it with John the Baptist. John the Baptist had his head beheaded. He was beheaded for uh, just a request by Herod's daughter-in-law. But what is interesting is that beheading, we all also noticed, was a result of something that took place in the bygone times where God is about to also do some interesting things in Revelation chapter 12. We spoke about that with Leviathan. Now, I won't go through that. But in this text here, we see the slaughter of a tenth. Now, this is going to be gruesome because this is what the Antichrist is going to do to the Jewish people. Cannibalism is on the rise, and we've seen it. Cannibalism will be also the main menu of the tribula tribulation. If you don't believe it, you need to go study the scriptures. You need to study the King James Bible and start looking at the scriptures rightly divided. You will see that the most wicked and vile and depraved activity is going to take place during this time. And the menu on the plate of the Antichrist is the Jewish people. Then I said, I, Lord, how long? This is Isaiah. He's asking the Lord, how long do I preach for? How long do I take the gospel? And what's the gospel? It's not the gospel of the grace of God, not one that Isaiah was preaching. Isaiah was preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of the Jewish people, the gospel of the coming Messiah. That's not the gospel of Paul's gospel. And so Isaiah is asking the Lord, how long do I preach? And the Lord says, and he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desert. That's how long you know, to preach for, till the whole thing's just wiped out. And the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Verse 13, of all things, chapter 6 of Isaiah, and verse 13, of all things. But yet in it shall be a tenth. Now, you think about a tenth. A tenth is a tithe. Christians tithe. Well, some do. The Jews did tithe. They tithe. They would tithe meticulously because a tenth was important. But watch this. And it shall return and shall be eaten as a tail tree and as an oak whose substance is in them when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. The holy seed. Who's that? The Jewish people. Holy seed. They will be slaughtered by the Antichrist and eaten. Cannibalism. It's the menu. And they'll have their heads basically as the altar. You got the altar sacrifice. That's where they would decapitate the body of an animal and there they would burn it, but they'd also partake of it. This is a whole sacrificial system of blood. Why? Because the devil always mimics God's sacrificial system. It's nothing that the devil doesn't do without copying the master. And that's what he does. So here we're seeing a picture of the slaughter. I'm not talking about... This is not just any slaughter. This is the absolute tyrannical and demonic, satanic slaughter of the Jewish people. And it's the reason why the Lord Jesus said that this time of the tribulation will be such a time such as never was since there was ever in the history of this nation, any nation. Keep going. First Thessalonians 5 and 5 to 7. Paul goes on to this and he's talking about the contrast between being asleep and being awake, being drunk and being sober. All these things are not only just in terms of physicality, but mainly because we're in the spiritual realm, everyone. Don't forget, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our battle. It's spiritual. We're in the kingdom of God. It's spiritual. It's the spiritual realm. And verse 5 says this, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. That's every single born-again Christian. We're all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Now, that says a lot. That says straightforward. If you're not of the light, if you're not of the day, then you're of the darkness. You're either one or the other. Therefore, let us not sleep. Here's the action. Don't sleep. Um, Paul's not saying, look, don't get some sleep. We're talking about the spiritual realm. As do others 
but let us watch two things, watch and be sober. So sleeping requires that we, you know, this idea of sleep requires that we also watch and this drunkenness as we see it requires us to be sober. The two things that we need to manage as Christians, as believers, because the time is about to take place when the trumpet's going to sound. Verse 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Romans chapter 7 says that it is high time to awake out of sleep. For the night cometh when no man can work. There is a time coming. We won't be here. We'll be caught out. But for the world, it's going to be a night time of seven years, and it is terrible. It is terror. I'm talking about a terror such as you could never imagine. Your greatest imagination of terror could not even place that in the tribulation. And as we've seen it, war is on its way, and war is judgment of God on uh, in this life. Hell is the judgment of God in the life hereafter, in the hereafter. So if you can remember those things, it really just starts to awaken you. Now, there's a whole scripture. We're almost done, everyone. The Lord Jesus Christ before his crucifixion. Remember the war. It started in the garden, in the Garden of Eden. And there was one in a garden when the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm going to go through with this. I'm going to do the Father's will and take this cup. And the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, went to Calvary, because he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And in his love, his mercy, he died for our sins, buried and rose again. But in, in the garden, he claimed that victory over Satan in this garden. What is interesting about the garden, he had also three disciples with him, but they just kept on sleeping. Very weak, very weak. Weak in the flesh, as we are all weak in the flesh. And this is a story for all of us, all of us. And they came to the place which was named Gethsemane, that's the Garden of the Olives. And he said unto his disciples, sit ye here while I pray. Sit ye here while I shall pray. Interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ does the same thing for us. He intercedes for his church. He intercedes for us daily. Always interceding for us. He never ceases his intercession for his people. In verse 37, he cometh and he findeth. This is after he's prayed, he's coming back and he sees the three disciples, his three closest friends, and they're falling, they're falling asleep. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and said unto him, Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Could you not watch one hour? His, that hour is very important. One hour. Verse 38, watch ye and pray, just like watch and be sober, lest ye enter in temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And that is the battle of every Christian is the flesh. The spirit is ready. The spirit does. The spirit wants to do that which the Lord's will. But the flesh, oh my, the flesh is weak. And again, the Lord went away. He prayed and he spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. There's a time coming, everyone. And I believe that time is all about this time of testing in Revelation chapter 3, verses 10. It's all about this hour of temptation that is to come upon all the world to try them that are on the that are in the world. But anyone who keeps the word of God's patience, the King James Bible, and keeps the word, I believe we're going to be kept away and it's going to be kept from that hour of temptation. Interesting. But here we go. <clears throat> and he returned, he found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, three times the Lord came to the, the disciples, and he said unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Semicolon. Behold, here we go. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. And now watch the words. This is the typology that's running. It's as if the Lord is giving us a script for right now. The script for the end of the church age, because the church is asleep. Everyone's either in the flesh and not watching or praying, and the church is asleep. And what's happening? The Lord says, sleep on now, take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. But then he says this thing here, 42. The most precious thing that I can see in this verse, the typology is running. 
And here it says, rise up. That's a rapture. Let us go. Why? Because straight after that, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Who's that? The son of perdition. And that was Judas. But as soon as the rapture takes place, everyone, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, appears. And that is it for this afternoon. Thank you for listening. And I hope that this has blessed you mightily. And we'll see you next week.